And when I died, I was still thinking about that huge penis. Zoinks! Mm. <laughs> it's the gay blade! Today's episode is brought to you by Surfshark. More on Surfshark in just a little bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. As always, hello there. I'm your host, Simon Wams here. Danny writes me a script. I'm going to read it. And Sam afterwards is going to edit it and he's going to add in some memes and stuff like that. It's going to be brilliant. We're all going to love it. What are we talking about? The strangest ever historical hoax is part two. That's because part one did well. That's how it always works here. Look at those of you now. Is this like, shall we just do a second one, Danny? Yes, mate. Let's go. Splash. It's puzzling how some people tend to get so excited about amazing mythical creatures such as mermaids and centaurs. Yeah, it does absolutely f puzzle the sh It's like, none of this is real. Look, it's just from fiction. No one, I mean, children like read Harry Potter and like, oh my God, it'd be cool if Harry Potter was real. Adults read mythology and are like, yeah, maybe centaurs are real. Maybe unicorns are real. It's just, I mean, it's deluded adults who I feel like should probably get some more going on in their life, to be honest, because what are you up to believing in mermaids? It's not real. Jokes on you, I'm into that shit! I mean, I get why unicorns are cool. Yeah, unicorns are cool, no one's debating it. Yeah, Harry Potter's cool. It's not real, is it? The rarer winged variety are essentially enhanced horses with added flight capabilities, and even your common garden variety unicorns have superpowered horns which can heal sickness. But in comparison, mermaids and centaurs are more like examples of something going a bit wonky in the design stage. A centaur's the thing where it's like the head of a man and the body of a goat or a horse. Either way, it's like something. <laughs> <laughs> There's been some bestiality involved here somewhere, hasn't there? That's how that happens. That's not normal. We're all nude here. <laughs> Just try asking a mermaid to nip down to the shops for a packet of custard creams, or watch the fallout when a centaur tries to climb a ladder or take the escalator. Of course, silly centaurs don't really exist, but mermaids are absolutely a thing. Danny, no! Why you t they're not! We've talked about this. I did a whole episode of I've got a podcast called Decoding the Unknown where we look at bullshit like this and we talk about why it's not real. And uh, mermaids thoroughly debunked. None of it's real. All of those mermaid skeletons and sightings, there's nothing credible. Nothing at all. It doesn't exist. Danny is wrong. Sorry, Danny. This was confirmed in 1842 by no less of an authority than Dr. J. Griffin from the British Lyceum. Lyceum? Lyceum of natural history. When the English gentleman arrived in New York with plans to show off his incredible new discovery to the world, the local press were assembled at his hotel, having already been tipped off about the quite remarkable new finds. Let me guess, let me guess, money and fame are going to be involved here somewhere, and he's going to use this fake discovery in order to gather money and fame together like some sort of money fame hoarder. You made those words up. And poor Dr. Griffin didn't even have a chance to check in before he'd been rudely badgered into letting the goldfish out of the bag. The hushed whisperings were true. Dr. Griffin had indeed found the mummified remains of a real mermaid caught near the Fiji Islands in the South Pacific. Oh, I, another possibility, of course, is that he himself has had the wool put out, pulled over his eyes and, like, some dude on an island has been like, Hey! Hey! Dude, look what I found. It's a mermaid. It, and it's, I definitely did stitch this together from the body of a child and a fish at all in any way. Definitely buy it, please. Buy it. It's expensive. It might sound a bit far-fetched in the modern ear, but this news broke during a time when unusual new animals, such as the frankly ridiculous platypus, were first being discovered. And Dr. Griffin himself pointed out the concept of a mermaid isn't so bonkers anyway. It is. How does it work? How does a mermaid work? It doesn't work on so many levels. We talked about this at length in the Decoding the Unknown episode. How does a mermaid function? Think it d No. He before the strange argument that many land creatures have their aquatic counterparts, such as sea lions and seahorses. Mate, have it. A sea, a, a seahorse looks not, it, it resembles a chess piece, not an actual horse. It's like way too upright, and not to mention, it's fing tiny. It's not like it's some giant f***ing horse thing riding around the ocean. It just vaguely resembles a horse. And not even a real horse, like a weird drawing of a up a, a step. It's ridiculous. 
I don't need to explain this any further, why this guy is an idiot. I think Dr. Griffin may have overlooked the fact that seahorses aren't exactly horses with gills, but no matter that. Yes, Danny. The discovery of the Fiji mermaid. Oh my god, I know this one. This is the one where it's like a, a top of a a body of a fish stitched onto the top of a child or something like the skeleton. It's nonsense, obviously. It's just like attached. They found this out in the future when they could test sh- like this. The discovery of the Fiji mermaid whipped up a frenzy in the national press and apparently caught the eye of a certain P.T. Barnum. This was the very same Barnum who was destined to become a circus operator, prankster, politician, and America's greatest showman. But he was also known for having all sorts of fake shit because it'd be like, honestly, P.T. Barnum, incredible businessman. All he wanted to do was get people to buy a ticket to his show. And if he says he's got a mermaid and it looks vaguely like a mermaid, of course he's going to be like, it's a real mermaid! If our my name isn't P.T. Barnum! But he was still in the very early days of his career at this point, having only just opened his new American museum in Lower Manhattan, which would go on to feature such exotic living exhibits as General Tom Thumb, the smallest person in the world. Barnum was hoping that Dr. Griffin would allow him to exhibit the Fiji mermaid at his new museum, and even went as far to create a range of publicity materials in anticipation. But Grumpy Pants Griffins refused, and so a miffed Barnum slagged off Griffin to the papers and let them have the promotional materials to help give the public a tantalizing glimpse of what they could have seen. I don't know. Sounds like that's just an opening of a negotiation, Barnum. Just be like, well, I'll give you more. I'll give you more money. At some point, just buy that mermaid. He knows it's fake. You know it's fake. Oh, maybe P.T. Barnum doesn't know it's fake. But just sell it, my man. Make some money. Make Or rent it out to him. He's going to make tons of money off this. Or do it yourself. What's going on? Thankfully, Dr. Griffin later had a change of heart and allowed Barnum's new museum to display the exhibit for a month before it was taken on a tour of the southern United States. The exhibit helped triple attendance to Barnum's museum and elevate the man's reputation to glorious new heights. Told you he's gonna make some money. He was gonna. But it has to be said that Barnum's promotional materials were a bit misleading. They all depicted the traditional image of a mermaid, a young, voluptuous, bare-breasted woman who just happens to have a fishy tail. <laughs> Sam, have you shown a picture of the Fiji mermaid on the screen? yet because it's like it's just creepy and gross <laughs> in reality the fiji mermaid was more like something that had crawled out of your deepest nightmares after having taken a dump in your head and then slowly suffocated to death from its own toxic fumes holy sh- Danny. <laughs> you are a wordsmith <laughs> i was just like it's f-ing ugly and daddy's like it crawled out of your deepest nightmares and took a dump in your brain ah ah no! On first glance, and indeed at last glance, the sinister dried up specimen looked like it was the result of some slippery customer attaching the head of a tortured monkey onto the bottom half of a salmon. Ah, I wasn't a kid, it was a monkey. That's slightly more tolerable, isn't it? But it's still just a monkey head attached to a fish body. Didn't people look at this and be like, bruh, it's just a monkey head attached to a, a fish body? <laughs> it's not a mermaid. It's not sexy at all! Where's my sexy dream mermaid? I'm a virgin. No! You're a few steps ahead of me at this point, aren't you? But the promotional material wasn't the only deceptive element about the exhibition of the Fiji mermaid. Dr. Griffin wasn't even a real doctor. What a huge surprise. And there was no such place as the British Lyceum of Natural History. In fact, Dr. Griffin's real name was Levi Lyman, who had been conspiring with Barnum all along. Wow. I mean, just in a way, you know, Barnum, respect. Because... You are a con man and an absolute genius businessman. The head of an orangutan had most likely been stitched onto the tail of a salmon at the beginning of the 19th century by Japanese fishermen, either as a joke or for use in a religious ceremony. The specimen eventually wound its way to Barnum in 1841, and it was the up-and-coming showman who began leaking stories to the New York press that Dr. Griffin was on his way to town with a dead mermaid. The very public tiff was then orchestrated between Barnum and the fake Dr. Griffin purely to get attention of the newspapers, offload the publicity material, and whet the public's appetite for the eventual unveiling of the mermaid at the American Museum. Again, genius. Barnum eventually revealed the true origins of the Fiji mermaid in his 1855 autobiography, whilst the fake specimen is believed to have been destroyed in a museum fire in the 1880s. Barnum again, even when he comes out and he talks about how it was fake, he's making money off it because he's selling an autobiography. Again, genius. But you have to give credit to Barnum for cooking up such an elaborately fiendish marketing stunt, and this proved to be his springboard for a shoal of subsequent spectacular scoops in a successfully sustained skinny dip into the seven seas of shockingly shady showmanship. (laughs) Danny. First time, mate. Not even a challenge. Come on. 
Come on. Challenge me, Danny! He had another particularly giant trick up his sleeves, but more on that in a moment. I'm going to interrupt today's video to tell you about our sponsor for today. A good friends over at Surfshark. What does Surfshark do? Well, they mask what you do online. That's what a VPN does. It basically encrypts everything you do. So let's imagine you're in like some coffee shop and there's like a Wi-Fi network. It's called like dodgy free Wi-Fi. Click if you dare. <laughs> I just like, I don't know about that, and I needed to check my PayPal. I needed to use my online bank here, like, but I don't want to. I don't even want to log into my Facebook. It's just too risky. But don't worry, you can use all those dodgy Wi-Fi's. I don't know, like, especially when I'm abroad or like traveling and stuff like that, and you don't have your mobile phone to like, because I mean, you do. But it's like, yeah, you know, you're just going to get destroyed by data charges. So you do end up using that dodgy Wi-Fi at the airport. But with uh, VPN, with Surfshark VPN, you don't have to worry about that. It encrypts everything. So it kind of blurs it out. So uh, the hackers, the, the people who might want to break in and take your stuff, they don't know what's going on. So you can use that dodgy Wi-Fi and check your PayPal and your internet banking, all of that good stuff. I have it on my laptop and my phone and my I have it on everything. And then wherever I am, you just fire it up. It takes like one click and you're just good to go. It's so easy. They describe... <laughs> <laughs> Using a VPN is like wearing pants. When you go outside, all the important stuff stays private and secure. So look, if you like wearing pants, uh, or trousers, as we'd call them in the UK, um, you need a VPN, and you need Surfshark VPN, obviously. Uh, the biggest thing for me, like I like the security, but that's kind of more like a necessity. It doesn't, you know, it's not like, oh, yay, security. One thing I do like um, is Netflix options and streaming options and all of this stuff. Open Netflix, see what you've got, close Netflix, like swipe up, close the app, and then fire up the VPN and then open Netflix back up and it's like, boom, your homepage looks completely different. Uh, travel to a different country, like go over to Europe if you're in America, Europe to America, blah, blah, blah. And you'll see a bunch of different options. It's really awesome. Plus, I don't know, maybe you live in some country where they're really intense and they don't let you browse certain websites while using a VPN. Maybe you're even watching this YouTube video via a VPN. That's what you can do with Surfshark. So look, all you've got to do is go to surfshark.deal slash blaze and you'll get 83% off and three months for free, which is brilliant. There's also a link below. Look, if you like wearing pants, get some Surfshark, yes? And now back to today's video. And who doesn't love wearing pants? I'm wearing pants right now. Clever hands, the math horse. Oh, I know this one. I know this one. This is about the horse that they, people thought it could. I'm not going to spoil it, but it, this is a really good one. This might not count as a purposeful hoax, as it's argued that the perpetrator was genuinely convinced of the findings of his own study. But considering his conclusion was that a horse could speak German and perform complex mathematical equations, maybe we should be concerned that the poor guy's elevator didn't quite reach the top floor. Wilhelm, I, I disagree, and you'll see why in a moment, because it's really clever what was going on here. And this guy wasn't a charlatan, he wasn't a con man, he genuinely believed that this horse was a genius. And honestly, I, I was thinking this whole, like, when I, when I first read about this, I was thinking, honestly, if, if I was in this dude's position, I'd probably also be tricked by my own experiments. You'll see. Let's go. Wilhelm von Alsten was a retired mathematics teacher, amateur, amateur horse trainer, and part-time mystic. Never mind, I'm nothing like this guy. <laughs> he lived in northern Berlin in the late 19th century. He was allegedly riding back home in his carriage one day when his horse named Hans made a sudden wife... <laughs> <laughs> the German horse named Hans. Of course it was. <laughs> Made a sudden wide turn without prompting in order to navigate the narrow driveway. This led Wilhelm to speculate that his clever horse might be capable of independent thought without the need to constantly whip it into submission. Imagine all the human wrist power that that would save. <laughs> I feel like if you're riding a horse, though, isn't whipping it part of the joy? <laughs> yeah! I'm just kidding, but I've seen, like, loads of, you know, like cowboy movies, movies set in the past, they're always like, yeah, I've always wanted to do that. No, sir, I don't like it. Uh, I, I rubs rode a camel and you got to whip the camel, if I remember correctly. It was kind of shit. Camels are a bit mean. Hans sadly died just as Wilhelm was in the process of trying to teach him the difference between left and right. But following further failed experiments with a disinterested cat and a downright bad-tempered bear, Mate, what are you up to? Wilhelm invested in a five-year-old Orlov Trotter stallion, which he also christened Hans, because of course he did. 
this is in Germany, and turned his backyard into a classroom for his student horse. By the end of the 19th century, Wilhelm was attracting headlines and touring Germany with free demonstrations of the mathematical prowess of his wonder horse, which now trotted proudly under the nickname of Clever Hans. <laughs> the brain box. Is that... Uh, I, I want to know what the original German was. What is clever in German? The brain box horse couldn't just perform square roots and fractions, though. He could also speak the German language, tell the time, identify musical tones, and keep track of the calendar. I'll just, if you don't know this story, two things that I'll just add here, in here. One, this is not a con. Two, Hans could absolutely not do any of these things. It turns out Hans is the con man. You'll see how it's really good. And it was all done with the simple tapping of a hoof. In front of a packed audience, Wilhelm would throw a question at Hans, who would then respond correctly every time by repeatedly tapping his hoof to indicate either the numerical answer or a text answer in which each letter was identified by its chronological place in the alphabet. If you asked him to spell Wazik, you'd have to be very, very patient. <laughs> Naturally, you're always going to get a few naysayers. Ah, ah, naysayers, ah, when it came to the matter of hyperintelligence horsepower. But in 1907, Wilhelm welcomed an official investigation by the German Board of Education with open arms, and the interesting conclusion was that no devious tricks were being pulled here. However, the psychology student Oskar Funkst fancied taking another good look later that same year and uncovered a string of curious findings during his own experiments. Oskar noted that the star pupil's success rate plummeted to the bottom of the class when Hans couldn't see his owner or if Wilhelm didn't know the answer himself. And there lies the rub. Getting there yet? Getting there yet? I mean, it's still cool what the horse can do, but you'll see. There was no suggestion that Wilhelm was a charlatan, and this was never meant to be a devious money spinner, as Wilhelm never charged admission for his demonstrations. Hans was simply picking up on the completely subconscious signals of his owner. This still makes him a pretty clever horse in my book, as the cues were so subtle that they would be largely undetectable by other humans. Every time Hans reached the correct number of hoof tabs, he would observe a lilliputian change in Wilhelm's body language, such as a slight decrease in tension or posture or breathing or facial expression. Isn't it incredible that a human being can't pick this up, but a horse can? A horse can read emotions, are like emotions, better than we can read other humans' emotions. Isn't that kind of mind blowing? I know he's not doing maths and shit, but now, like, I remember being around a horse, like, after I first read about this story, and I was like, don't look too tense or something, the horse knows. That horse knows, just stroke him gently and enjoy it. Just, just, just don't be afraid of him. I'm slightly afraid of horses because they're big. And they can, like, I'm always really afraid of going behind a horse. I think at some point someone told me, don't go behind a horse because it'll kick you. And so now I'm always like, oh. Don't go behind that horse. Gotta step back from that horse. Is that true? Horsey people, let me know in the comments below. I'm also like... I'm really, like, not into horses. Because I think, like, I'm a parent. And my wife likes horses. But she's not she's not a horsey person. She's just like, horses are nice. If I had an opportunity to ride a horse, I'd love to ride a horse. Maybe I'll take up horse riding. I'm like, no! Nope. <laughs> It's like, I, I'm not so worried about my wife taking up a horse riding. Who cares? She can do whatever she wants. But like, my kids, because then you got to be driving the kids to the horsey riding place. It smells. It's expensive. You have to go watch them do their horsey riding stuff, which is really boring. And it's just such a big loser as a parent. Like, <laughs> And also, it's not like they're going to go on to become, like, some horse riding champ. And even if you do, horse riding champion? That's not... Is that a career? I mean, unless you're, like, an elite jockey or something. And do elite jockeys even, like, is that a career? I guess it is a career. But I'm like, don't get into this horsey sh**, okay? Don't do it. And I was like to my wife, don't encourage it. <laughs> You'll be the one taking her to help horse riding bullshit. I'm the cool dad. That's, that's my thing. This was the horse's cue to stop tapping and accept his treat for being such a clever hands. And the trick obviously didn't work if Wilhelm didn't know the answer himself, or if he was out of sight. Even today, the clever hands effect is a term used by animal psychologists to describe the effect of an animal receiving unintentional signals from a trainer. The weird thing is that you're usually unable to suppress the cues even if you've been made aware of them, and this is why the handlers of sniffer dogs often have no idea where the coke has been planted during training exercises, otherwise they might unwittingly give the game away. Wilhelm refused to accept these findings and carried on with the silly demonstrations until his death in 1909. Poor old Hans later suffered from hoof disease before he got drafted into military service during the First World War, after which the trail goes cold. He was drafted into service in the First World War and no one ever heard from him again. Clever Hans was killed! <laughs> Probably got that trench foot. Trench hoof. Ah. 
Still, Wilhelm von Alsten may have been as stubborn as a mute, but he lived to the surprisingly ripe old age of 496. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> oh, this is going to be a joke about Clever Hans' maths ability, isn't it? However, I think it must have been Clever Hans who worked out the numbers for the obituary. <laughs> Predictable but funny, Danny. Well done. The Cardiff Giants. The Bible makes reference to the giants who roamed the earth in the old days, although the good book is surprisingly light on detail. The giants in question may just have been people who were quite tall rather than the race of people who clearly built the alien landing pad that we now call Stonehenge. <laughs> yeah, the problem is. And uh, uh, this has also come up in a Decoding the Unknown, which if you're enjoying today's episode, you'll love that podcast. It's just like this, except me shitting over this stuff even harder than I am already. The, uh, God, I lost my train of thought entirely. Let's carry on. What are we talking about? I didn't sleep well last night. For some reason, the last few nights, that same kid who I'm trying to not get into horsey stuff has been coming into the bedroom being like, and I'm like, did you have a nightmare? And she's like, yes. And I'm like, oh no. And it happens like two or three times a night. Apparently kids go through this like night terror phase. And so it's like, do you want me to sleep next to you? And she's always like, yes, dad. And I'm like, this is the sweetest thing ever, but I'm going to be so tired. <laughs> and it's going to affect my work. And I even feel it today. I'm like, Charles, Simon, just do it. Why? Why is it like this? Drink your 17th coffee. So good. The giants in question may just have been people who have read that already. Oh my god. But whilst the idea of giants might seem a bit far-fetched to some, we've been digging up evidence of their existence since 1869. That was the year when a couple of genuinely shocked workers innocently digging a well in Cardiff, New York, came across the petrified corpse of a ten-foot-tall man. The Cardiff giant was found complete with ribs, an Adam's apple, skin pores, the slightest hint of a smug smile, and a freakishly massive knob which might explain said smug smile it's like yes i had a huge penis <laughs> and when i died i was still thinking about that huge penis mm. <laughs> it's the gay blade. oh wait was it was a statue so while he was being carved he was thinking about his huge pe- yep yes Yes! Naturally, some so-called experts and party boobers dismissed it straight away as a rather poorly designed statue. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sleepy today. It's like not a statue. It's a fake statue pretending to be like a, um, like a, oh, like a, what's it called? A fossil. Oh my god, small brain. Come on. Come on. Clear those cobwebs. But the discovery fired up the imagination of more open-minded souls who began to speculate over what exactly had been dug up here. Was this proof that the book of Genesis had been bang on the money when it stated that giants once roamed the earth? Spoiler alert, no. Was it a particularly tall ancestor of the Onondaga people? Or was it perhaps some kind of ancient carving? William Newell didn't seem too bothered either way. He was the farmer who owned the lands upon which the corpse had been found. He set up a tent on his farm, inside which he displayed the Cardiff giant visitors for a modest fee of 25 cents, quickly doubling this to 50 cents when he realized just how much interest he was generating. Over the next few weeks, literally hundreds of archaeologists, journalists, Bible bashers. <laughs> Love that phrase. And thrill seekers flocked to the remote farm every day to hand over their money and gaze up at this colossal new find. It was swiftly sold for $23,000 to a syndicate who took the giant to New York to exhibit it in a museum where it drew crowds big enough to attract the interest of a familiar face. He wanted in on the action. P.T. Barnum's entering the picture, isn't he? Isn't he? Why well, was our old friend P.T. Barnum? Yes, the genius legend. I know he was kind of a scammer, but it was all like in good fun. And I mean, just legends. But on this occasion, the showman was oblivious to the origins of the specimen, and if anything, Barnum was largely responsible for exposing the fraud. Rewinding back a year, a tobacconist George Hull found himself locking horns with a loony vicar who believed that every passage in the Bible should be interpreted literally, including the goofy bits about giants. There are people, though, who believe, like, the word of Bible is the word of God and therefore it should be interpreted literally. Which is insane. I, I feel like we should just do a video just about have we done this i feel like we've done this actually about like crazy from the bible we've done this there's some crazy or cr did, well maybe it was crazy from mythology because that got wild for example in the non-canonical book of eunuch it's clearly stated what the is non-canonical what does that mean doesn't that mean like it's not actually a part of the bible it's clearly stated that giants help noah build his fancy ark that's a load of nonsense of course we all know, all know it was giraffes that did most of the heavy lifting and what we all know is that noah's not real it's a fictional story about a giant flood 
Can you imagine? It was like, what? <laughs> He's got him, his wife, and a few kids. We'd all be like having like third ears and shit <laughs> if that was how it worked, because it'd all be massively inbred. Jesus. I have a crush on my brother. What should I do? If he's hot, go for it. But the conversation prompted George to cook up an atheist prank designed to whip up the god botherers. He hired a group of men to quarry out a 10-foot block of gypsum at Fort Dodge, which he then shipped to a stonecutter in Chicago who carved the features of the giant using the face of George himself as a likeness. George then hooked up with his cousin William Newell, who just happened to own that farm. Together, they hatched a scheme to bury the giants on William's land under the veil of moonlight and then patiently waited for the best part of a year until the locals had forgotten all about the recent movements of strange cargo. William's unwitting laborers finally started stumbled across the giants after they'd been randomly instructed to start digging a well in an obscure part of the farm for no discernible reason. Barnum had later offered $60,000 to the syndicate just to rent the Cardiff giant for three months to display in his American museum. Oh my god, that would be so much money today. I know $60,000 is a large amount of money, but in counting for inflation, it's going to be like millions. Easy. But after his generous offer was surprisingly turned down, Barnum made a cheap plaster replica and displayed that as the real thing instead. <laughs> Barnum's just like, f*** it, you're not letting it to be I'll make my own. Yours is as fake as mine, guys. We all know it. We all know it. I'm just doing it on the cheap. Funnily enough, Barnum's fake of a fake ended up attracting bigger crowds than the original, at which point the syndicate sued him. But the judge ruled that an injunction could only be slapped on Barnum if the syndicate could prove the authenticity of the original Cardiff John. And guess what? They fucked guard because it's not authentic. The syndicate could do no such thing. The game was up, but shortly afterwards, George Hall confessed to the whole scheme. He still made a very tidy profit from the venture, which he later blew on terrible investments, and even after the giant was revealed to be a hoax, both versions continued to attract crowds for the sheer novelty value and are still on display in museums today. Oh my god, dude, you created an absolute money spinner. That's mad. Maybe we should have paid more attention to the experts who noticed something peculiar about the Cardiff giants on day one. Fresh chisel marks were still plainly visible on the supposed ancient corpse. I'm no expert, but that's even fishier than the Fiji mermaid. Yes, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. And he's going to use this fake discovery in order to gather money and fame together like some sort of money fame hoarder. You made those words up. <laughs>